My name is Edna Wangoi. I am one of the coordinators for the Wealth and Poverty theme. Um, and the talk that we are going to hear today is one of several talks, uh, events actually, that is associated with the Wealth and Poverty Focus on Africa Week. And you've all received handouts, or there are more handouts to pick on your way out, on the series of events that will be um, associated with this, with this, um, with this focus on Africa. Um, for those who don't know much about themes, um, it's actually a relatively new way of organizing your courses. This is targeting undergraduate students at Ohio University. And it's a, it's an, it's a way to pick your tier courses, tier one, tier two, tier three, so that they are organized around a topic or a theme that is relevant to students in this day and, and age. And I have included a website um, that you can go to if you need to find out more information about themes. The theme that we are coordinating, um, Dr. Kim and I, is a wealth and poverty theme. And we tend to focus on questions of inequality in, in, inside the US, but also internationally. Uh, last spring, we had a series of events that was focused on Appalachia. Um, and this year, this semester, we have these events that are focused on Africa, and there'll be new, uh, different events that we'll focus on in the, sp in the spring semester. Now, before I introduce Dr. Baumeister to introduce the speaker, I would like to recognize that this series of events would not be possible without the general support of the dean, two deans in particular, that's the dean for the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Dean for the College of Health Sciences and Professions. We do have some of the events later on that are focused on health, um, and hence the, in, the, the kind of coming together of these two um, deans. Well, without further ado, I would like to invite Larry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Edna, and, and welcome everybody to uh, this first uh, fall semester a public lecture uh, in the wealth and poverty theme. And I'm uh, Larry Burmeister. I am in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And I'm a member of the wealth and poverty theme tribe, as well as a couple of other uh, theme groups. And um, it's really my pleasure today to introduce uh, our speaker for this uh, public lecture event, uh, Professor Philip McMichael is a professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at Cornell University. He's a prolific author, uh, written uh, several widely acclaimed uh, books. Among, among uh, his um, achievements are uh, manuscripts entitled Settlers and the Agrarian Question, Development of Social Change, A Global Perspective. I think this is a, a book that uh, some of our uh, faculty have used in development courses over the years, and uh, Phil is engaged in uh, a new edition of, of this uh, book. And he's uh, recently uh, published uh, a, a manuscript entitled Food Regimes and Agrarian Questions, and is the editor of another um, compilation of essays entitled Contesting Development, Critical Structures for Social Change. And I think one of Phil's major contributions to the uh, scholarship of uh, globalization and food is his theorization of a succession of historical food regimes. Um, and uh, this is, I think, a path-breaking work, and uh, I think he'll touch on, on some of that in his talk today. And the other thing I wanted to mention about Phil is he's um, somewhat of an activist scholar and what we would in sociology call a public sociologist. And he's currently a member of the UN Food and Agricultural uh, Organization's civil society mechanism that is working on uh, world food security issues. And I think uh, Phil uh, brings his academic work to uh, practical uh, application in, in that kind of a role. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to turn uh, the podium over to Professor Philip McMichael, and uh, he's going to speak on food sovereignty and uh, global hunger games. <laughs> 
Thanks very much for that generous introduction, Larry. And uh, welcome, everybody. Glad you could all make it. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get Jennifer Lawrence to show up with me today. Um, so you'll have to s stick with me. And um, I'm going to run through some slides and try to make a case about um, how food security is managed um, and contested in the world today, and then finish with some comments about the food sovereignty movement. So the first um, issue is to, to think about global hunger and what do we really mean by feeding the world and who actually does feed the world. Those are questions that I'll try to answer today. Um, and um, you know, what are the current trends in the global food system? And are they the only choice? <clears throat> so to start off with, I have a couple of slides um, to try and capture images of inequality in the world. And this is a um, diagram that was put together by a Dutch sociologist called Anke Hoogveld, um, where she argues that um, only 20% of the world's population are really bankable, that is people who could get bank loans. And then, um, you know, there are outer, outer bands of 30% and 50% folks that are excluded. Doesn't mean they don't have any money or use money, but it does mean that um, there's no way they would command um, a bank loan. Here's another um, depiction of human poverty, which essentially shows South Asia and China and Africa as being the, um, the big centers of human poverty. Um, and um, you can see, you can see a, a very small Australia down there in the bottom right-hand corner, which is where I'm from. Okay, so the Global Hunger Games. Um, what I want to argue today is uh, are these um, four particular issues that uh, I think are very central to understanding how hunger and food security operate. The first is to argue, um, just as in the Hunger Games, um, booklets, books, uh, how many of you read, have read the Hunger Games book? Probably all of you, because you were teenagers when, when it came out, right? I read the first one until about two-thirds of the way through and decided I, I, I figured, the rest of the, figured the rest of it out. <laughs> but um, I think the, the, uh, the Hunger Games idea is, is, um, is fascinating, um, the, the woman who's, who's put the books together, because she's capturing the sort of dystopic features of um, food insecurity, food security issues, and, and how politics are very much involved in who gets to, to be fed and who doesn't get to be fed, and also the competition that um, uh, it's sort of an allegory about the marketplace. And so the dystopic features which I'll talk about today are displacement and enclosure of land in particular, um, also the increasing lottery nature of, of food availability, in other words, um, we see crops now for food crops, feed crops, for, for livestock, and we see fuel crops for biofuels, for energy. Um, and um, we see a lot of investors who are not farmers, who are not agribusinesses, but who have money to spend, in, in, including my pension fund, who are investing in agriculture, investing in land. And to them, it doesn't really matter what's being produced on the land, so, so long as it brings a good price. So if it's feed, or fuel, it means food is not being produced. So there's a lottery system. Um, and then finally, the rising land deals, which are often called the global land grab, which I'll talk about also. And all of these dimensions, I think, are very central to what I would um, characterize um, rather sketchily as uh, global hunger games. Um, so this is a photograph taken in an airport recently which I think captures one of the really interesting issues. Who, who has money in, invested in Prudential? Well, a lot of people put their retirements in there. Um, and what's happening is that investment houses are increasingly looking at land offshore, overseas, or even in, within this country um, to invest in because it's a good investment, um, because the rest of the economy has been pretty stagnant for a while. Um, manufacturing is going overseas, as you know now, China's um, in a downturn. And so land is something that um, people realize is, can't be created, it's there for the taking. And um, so what's happening is that more and more investors are investing in land. Uh, and of course, this is, um, this is an incredible um, statement here, village farms becoming global opportunities. Think about it. Village farms, these are people who farm the land, who produce food for themselves and their neighbors, 
and you have investment houses beginning to say, well, let's come in and take that land over. And one of the consequences, of course, is displacement. And then down the bottom, you have somebody holding up, who is the state to encroach on our lands? Um, which is a, an interesting question, an interesting way to think about it, because many governments, particularly in Africa, but elsewhere also, are very complicit in selling or leasing lands to foreign investors, and I'll come back to that later on. Okay, so development scenarios. Uh, this is just a, a really sketchy way of sort of capturing ways in which we think about development that is from poverty to wealth to sort of pick up on the theme of, the, of this curriculum theme. Secondly, we assume development is about the movement from rural to urban civilization. Thirdly, um, the driver has to do with displacing, labor displacing technologies being employed like farm machinery on farms, um, in factories, uh, mechanization, now automation, and of course what we're finding increasingly is that people are very concerned about job opportunities in the future because of robot robotization, etc. Um, but anyway, we, within the farm sector in particular, we see small producers being dispossessed and it's, we just assume, well, that's the way of development and modernity works um, and this confirms the importance of technology of relieving um, work on the farm, etc. We, we, we never think about, well, what happens to those people who leave the land um, and have to work in uh, mind-numbing factory situations? Um, and then we, we have the consequence of agriculture without farmers, which is a concept that was coined by La Via Campesina, the International Peasant Coalition. But it's an interesting phrase because it tells us something about how agriculture is being industrialized and farming as a knowledge and as a practice, as, as a culture, um, as a way of life is disappearing. Um, and then one of the impacts, or several of the impacts that I think are really important are the, the planet of slums phenomenon where one in six of the world's population now lives in slums. Ecosystem degradation, which the United Nations has been very concerned about and put out a big report in 2005 called the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and of course, climate change. Now, one of the issues I want to raise is are the ep epistemic issues involved here, and that is that um, social theory, and I'm thinking of sociology or political science or economics, um, systematically have separated humans from nature. Um, so we have theories about how societies work, how politics works, etc., but they're never grounded in ecology. They're never grounded in our, our environmental foundations, um, even though um, we depend so much on nature um, for um, our survival. So we externalize our ecological foundations and impacts, and there are some economists, ecological economists, who are attempting to reintegrate economics with ecology and um, develop a, um, a more holistic understanding um, of this process. We also industrialize agriculture with the biophysical override, which means we use chemicals and fertilizers and um, manufactured seeds to create a certain kind of agriculture that doesn't depend on the local um, environment, um, takes nutrient cycles in, in the soil and the water out of the equation. We assume capital and energy intensive technologies are more efficient and productive. Um, this is all part of the development modernity mantra. Um, and we also assume that biodiverse food producing systems are less efficient and productive. And what I want to talk about a little bit later is um, that that assumption is beginning to be challenged quite consistently now, particularly in the United Nations. So here's an example of biophysical override. It's, it's, um, um, this is industrial agriculture par excellence in Brazil, um, quickly surpassing other countries in food production and exports. And the, the writer says, but can it continue to make agricultural gains without destroying the Amazon? Um, so um, you know, Brazil has become one of the big exporters. Now an alternative um, depiction of agriculture would be agroecology, which is now beginning to take hold in the United Nations system as being practiced by farmers all, all around the world um, and they're developing agroecological schools where you develop diverse system, farming systems, um, crop rotation, cover crops, um, and um, agro, agroforestry and, and so forth. And there have been studies that are arguing that agri, actually agroecology um, produces on, on a unit of land much more food um, than a single monoculture on the same size 
land plot. Um, then we have aquaculture um, and a shrimper in a book that I'll mention in a minute was quoted as saying we've turned the blood of our people into an appetizer. Now the shrimper was referring to um, shrimping as the source of their livelihood um, in these mangroves and these mangroves have been progressively turned into aquaculture um, operations. Um, this is called the Blue Revolution and Juan Martinez Alia is the author of the book. It's called the, um, um, Environmental Poverty. And he, he says, he points out um, the Blue Revolution entails the loss of livelihood for people living directly from and selling mangrove products. Beyond direct human livelihood, other functions of mangroves are lo also lost, perhaps irreversibly, such as coastal defense against sea level rise, fish breeding grounds, carbon sinks, repositories of biodiversity, together with aesthetic values. Um, now, all of those environmental goods um, we don't think about when we consume shrimp, shrimp. But if you follow the shrimp commodity chain back from um, you know, our, our restaurants and, and, and see where the shrimp is being grown um, and then recognize the social and ecological impact, um, it's quite dramatic. Looking at rural profiles quickly, 70% of hunger is concentrated in rural areas, 70% of the hungry are women. Um, agriculture is a livelihood for 40% of the world, so that's a huge um, minority percentage if you think about it. And then peasants, small farmers, small producers, produce two-thirds of the world. I mean, they, are, they constitute two-thirds of the world's food producers, producing the majority of staple crops. And I think I mentioned um, that um, small producers, including urban gardeners, are responsible for 70% of the world's food. The FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, did a study recently arguing that smallholder agriculture is the foundation of food security in many countries <clears throat> and went on to um, quote, as I said, this scientific consensus that's emerging, the potential efficiency of smallholder farming relative to large farms has been widely documented, focusing on the capacity of smallholders to achieve high production levels per unit of land through the use of family labor in diversified production systems. Um, so this this kind of um, understanding of smallholder agriculture, I say, is taking hold and um, I'm very active in Rome. I'm going there next month where um, the Committee on World Food Security um, you know, discusses and debates these kinds of issues and it's quite fascinating to see. I think there's a sea change going on where people are beginning to recognize the value of um, diverse smallholder farming. This is a pie chart that gives you an idea of uh, where, the, where the world's food comes from. 50% um, from small peasant farmers, 30% um, from the industrial food chain, and then the other 20% uh, um, from urban and, and hunting and gathering um, food, food producers. However, the food security regime, which I talked about this morning, some of the students are here in, uh, today, this afternoon, um, the US took the position at the GATT the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs meetings um, that began in 1986 in Uruguay, which led to the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1995. I mean, it was founded in 1994, but um, began in 95. And he, the US um, representative said the idea that developing countries should feed themselves is an anachronism from a, from a bygone era. Now, the reason that he was saying that was that the United States um, was the world's breadbasket at the time um, and continues to be to some extent. Um, so that after World War II, the United States set up um, a, a food aid program whereby it began to dispose of surplus agricultural products um, into uh, post-colonial countries, particularly ones that were friendly to the United States. And so the US sort of became responsible for feeding a percentage of those populations. And the Europeans picked up that model and have begun to, done the same, <coughs> began to do the same thing. And the reason the GATT talks opened up was because the US and the Europeans were fighting it out and so things were getting a little volatile and, and, um, and heated. So they decided they needed to come to some agreement. Um, <coughs> at the time, food security became redefined not as the right to food, but the right to purchase food. So if you stop and think about that, the right to purchase food privileges those people with money. Um, and it certainly doesn't do anything about people who um, 
uh, growing food for themselves and for their neighbours and for their local markets. Um, and so if you think about it, the right to purchase food um, implicitly allows for the idea that uh, those small guys should disappear and should simply come onto the market, and get a job and, and, um, and buy their food. So that's the, the tension that we're, um, we're dealing with at the moment. Um, now in that context from 1980 to 2006, and this is known pretty much as the neoliberal period, public expenditure on agriculture in the global south fell 50%. <clears throat> Meanwhile, farmers in the OECD countries, that's the rich north, global north, were receiving direct payments um, to the order of $125 billion. Um, so it gives you some sense of the way in which um, northern farmers were being privileged um, compared with southern farmers who were losing their um, support systems. And structural adjustment that the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund those kinds of policies that were developed dismantled the public agencies providing farmers with access to land, credit, insurance, etc. Um, so what I'm trying to get at across he uh, here is that um, across this period from 1980 up to the present day, small farmers in post-colonial global southern countries found themselves increasingly bereft of public support uh, for their economy. Um, and found themselves increasingly exposed to cheap imports from the global north, from farmers who were heavily subsidized, as we know, in the United States and Europe. <clears throat> so this gives you an idea of the um, falling global uh, official development assistance across from 1983 to 2007. Um, this gives you an idea of the um, relative subsidies, um, France, Germany, Italy, UK, U USA and Japan versus Ghana, Kenya, Malawi and Tanzania. So there's clearly an inequality in support of agriculture across the global north, global south division. Um, as a consequence, uh, from 1961 up to 2011, which is the latest figures that I've been able to find, um, you see a rising, a very steep rising um, food dependency where uh, less developed countries, um, the value of the food that they're importing um, just rises exponentially from, nine, from the mid-90s um, around the time of the World Trade Organization's establishment up to the present day. Um, at the same time, they're also exporting um, food um, to pay for these imports, but the exports are not maintaining, um, they're not staying, staying with, the, with, the, with the cost of the imports. Um, one can extrapolate from this that um, this is one explanation for the um, severity of the food crisis as, as it hit global southern people in the global south in 2007, 2008. So just to give you some examples um, of food dependency in the south, um, these countries, Indonesia, India, Peru and Africa, um, Africa is a continent of course, but I'm, I'm just sort of capturing some data to, to show that um, the extent of um, growing food dependency through this period where countries are becoming less self-reliant um, and having to increase in, in, increase in th their food imports. And, and in 2007, when the price of food shot up, um, the import bill in the, in the south um, went up 25%, which was quite remarkable. Um, so prior to 2007, we had what's referred to as a cheap food regime where, as I alluded to earlier, northern farm subsidies are enabling um, surplus foods to be dumped in southern markets at artificially reduced prices, prices below the cost of production. Um, so, um, so subsidies allows Amer American farmers, say, or European farmers to stay on the land um, even though the food that they're being produced is sold at, at very low prices. And one of the reasons is so that they can capture um, the agribusinesses, the, the trading companies can capture markets in the global south, much the same as I mentioned earlier today, how Walmart might come to town and begin to drop its prices to drive out local businesses and then push its prices up later. Um, the low price was institutionalized by the World Trade Organization's agreement on agriculture insisting that all farm sectors be liberalized. In other words, to become a member state of the WTO, you had to liberalize your farm sector, open it to competition from the outside. And um, 
As a consequence, there was displacement of smallholders in the 1990s, 20 to 30 million, according to conservative estimates by the FAO. Um, and in Mexico, in particular, we saw um, a couple of million campesinos um, dispossessed during that um, period. NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, was brought in in 1994. And by the turn of the century, about two million farmers um, had left the land in Mexico. And um, as I like to say, do you ever wonder why Mexicans come to the United States? Well, you have to go back and look at how they've been subject to artificially cheapened corn coming from Iowa being dumped in their market and small maize farmers being unable to compete in the marketplace in Mexico and therefore, therefore giving up their land and coming to work on American farms across the border. Oh, well, there we go. I wonder why Americans come to work. So Via Campesina, the, the large peasant organization, uh, coined this very elegant way of capturing the essence of this process. The massive movement of food around the world is forcing the increased movement of people. Putting it very simply, but it sort of captures the, the issue, I think. Um, and this kind of displacement, Mike Davis, a historian in California, wrote a book called The Planet of Slums that came out in 2006. And um, this just captures the, uh, the trend line. And Daravi is the, um, uh, um, the slum, the, it's the biggest slum in South Asia, just outside of Mumbai. Um, dispossession, this is a picture of um, Indian peasants on the move and bus stations, the sort of bus stations you see in India. World Bank pointed out that by, to, by this year, peasant migrants in India would equal twice the combined population of the United Kingdom, France and Germany. So that's a huge amount of people who are moving out of the countryside um, into the slums in, in Dharavi and, and elsewhere. Um, so part of the issue here is that um, the, the trade regime, the food regime th that I've referred to was premised on feeding the world through agro-exporting and in, initially it was designed through the American and U European um, granaries that th those, those areas, those regions of the world become, would feed the world. Um, but now agro-exporting has become much more widespread and sort of adopted everywhere now and, and um, it takes many different forms and it's not just grains coming from Europe and the United States, it's also high value horticultural products coming from Kenya and Mexico, for example, um, to North America or to Europe, um, wherever the markets are. And, and so it's, it's quite remarkable when you think about the amount of high value food that's being produced in the global south on land that could be used to grow food locally for populations to um, reduce their dependence on importing grains to feed um, the basic staple diets. So the food crisis came along in 2007-2008 um, as, a, as a kind of long-term outcome, if you like, of the agrarian crisis that I've mentioned. One of the things I didn't mention was that in 2008, the World Bank, um, which, pr which produces a, an annual world development report, finally decided to focus on agriculture after 25 years. They went for two and a half decades without mentioning agriculture and all of a sudden their new world development report in 2008 was focused on agriculture for development, which tells you a couple of things. One is that agriculture had been marginalized in the development agencies in the public discourse um, for a long time during the early neoliberal period. And secondly, it tells you that um, by the 21st century, um, people were beginning to be concerned about the state of um, the farm sectors in, in the Global South in particular and the issue of food security. So the bank was attempting to address the issue in its own particular way. Uh, meanwhile, there were protests going on in the same year in Mexico. Um, food prices were highest since 1990, 2007, 2008. Um, there were different causes of the food crisis. Um, food riots took place in over 30 states, from Italy to India, Mozambique to the um, North American states, Middle East, North American, North, North African states. Um, and one of the questions that one would ask, and I did some writing on this with Raj Patel, who some of you may have heard of, we asked the question, why were they rioting? Well, they weren't just rioting because food was expensive now, they were rioting also because they recognized that their governments had sold out to the international system um, and had put these countries at risk by being food dependent. And then, of course, when food shot up, 
um, the countries that were exporting food decided not to export any food anymore because they wanted to keep it for their own population. So now all of a sudden those countries that were food dependent couldn't get sufficient grains to feed their own population. And so the riots um, drew attention to this problem across the world. So the big question here is um, uh, about market failure. And one of the, one of the reasons why um, the crisis was so bad was that um, governments and private grain dealers had sold off the inventories um, that were normally kept um, in the event that there'd be a crisis or what have you. And so Paul Krugman in the New York, New York Times wrote a very interesting article about it. Um, but it was, was it widely understood that this was a real problem. And of course, now we're seeing um, countries like India who are beginning to realize that they need to maintain inventories, partly because the world food price system has become so volatile and they want to make sure that they don't have riots because the worst thing a government can have are um, citizens, particularly urban citizens, rioting about food. Um, what's interesting about this um, diagram is that it shows a couple of things. One is the sudden spike in wheat and rice prices down the bottom around 2007, 2008. But it also shows you the countries that were formerly um, grain exporters all of a sudden putting export bans, restrictions on exporting their grain. So it's quite significant if you look at it. Um, what it means is that there's less grain available on the world market and so countries that are food dependent all of a sudden find themselves um, up that creek. I can't remember the name of it, but anyway. Um, so um, at the same time you can see the clenched fist which gives you an idea of where some of the um, food riots were taking place. So what's very interesting about this process, and I, as an analyst um, I think it's interesting because um, the whole food security idea was based on the, the premise of free trade and all of a sudden free trade disappeared at, at the food crisis when exporters decided not to export grain anymore and to keep it for their own populations. So think about it, that's a real market failure. It means that the market's not working somehow. So food, food riots we saw in 2008 um, across the world. In Rome, and I was at this conference, um, there was a World Food Summit in, in Rome and then alongside it was the Civil Society Conference called the Terra Preta uh, Forum. Um, and at the end of that forum, we came out with this statement that the um, food and climate crises are being used as opportunities to entrench corporate control of world agriculture and the ec ecological commons, and that these proposals will only deepen these crises. So what we were trying to do was to argue that um, the world was at a uh, threshold, an interesting threshold, a turning point, and there were two ways to go. When you come to a fork in the road, you don't take it. Um, you, <laughs> you decide that you, you either keep going the same way, agribusiness as usual, or you begin to shift gears and try to develop um, safeguards against this kind of market failure, which essentially means um, supporting and promoting domestic um, farm sectors of domestic food security, and that's become the, the new debate now um, in the United Nations. Um, one of the reasons why the food crisis occurred was um, the competition between food and fuel. Um, the human rights rapporteur in the United Nations argued that biofuels were a crime against humanity, so things were pretty inflammatory at that time. And what was interesting was that biofuels were seen as a green or a transitional fuel um, that um, would reduce our dependence on petroleum. Um, and the World Bank, of course, es estimated that the grain required to fill a tank of a, an SUV could feed one person for a year. So there was some recognition of the, um, the trade-off involved. Um, and I've just stuck down there the bottom that um, for Americans, we only spend 13% of our budget on food, but for Chinese and Indians, it's a much higher um, percentage. And so if food prices go up, um, it really affects the household budget in a very profound way. Um, in 2002, the WTO Director General said history has shown that food security doesn't equal self-sufficiency of a country. This is an interesting um, statement. Food shortages have to have to do with poverty rather than being a net food importer. Food security nowadays lies not only within in the product, local production, but in a country's ability to finance imports of food through exports of other goods. So one of the ways in which the World Bank and the 
IMF um, and the other development agencies encouraged countries to import food was to develop exports of coffee. Ever wonder why every country in the world now produces coffee? Um, or, you know, high value um, fruits and vegetables, shrimp, um, etc. I've underlined 2002 because by 2008, the food crisis showed that that kind of statement um, was now an illusion, that such comparative advantage prescriptions unravel when you have food export bans. Um, and that's, that's meaning that um, instead of growing high value uh, foodstuffs in the global south to sell so that you can purchase basic grains for your population, um, if you start having export bans in the middle of a food crisis like that, all of a sudden that whole system breaks down. Um, and so what I argue is that um, after this crisis, agro security mercantilism became the new thing. Now what this refers to is the, the yellow parts of the world um, are the countries that are investing in land offshore. East Asia, South Asia, and the Middle Eastern states. And it's a fascinating process. So instead of getting your food from the global marketplace and dealing with food security in that way, and that was the mantra of the World Trade Organization, what's happening now is countries are taking matters into their own hands and investing in land, either leasing it or purchasing it offshore, largely in Africa, but also in countries like Australia, um, and um, making sure that they, the Chinese government or the Korean government um, have access to food whenever they need it because they have farmland elsewhere in the world. It's a fascinating process and um, it's, it's another scramble for Africa, for those Africanists in the audience. Um, and the triangles show um, where hunger is concentrated in the world and so, so the areas in which um, the colours don't come out too well here in, in, on this slide, but the, the areas in which the investments are taking place are in, in many cases those areas where hunger is mo most concentrated. So it's a fascinating process and it means that the organisation of the world, um, the organisation of the food system, the food regime, is actually undergoing a very big transition. And so one of the parts of this transition are the, um, the new enclosures, what's what's called colloquially as the, the global land grab. And what we found during the, the 2000s was that the land deal patterns were 37% for food, 35% for biofuels. So biofuels were a very significant part of the um, process of grabbing land elsewhere. And um, a lot of people were involved in this. My pension fund, I, men I mentioned this, um, any, any academic here who belongs to the TIA know, th know that they're their pension fund is investing in, in land across, across the world. Um, so one of the ways in which uh, this is facilitated is the, st the, gov the governments that are receiving the investment along with the World Bank um, are reclassifying peasant land or common land, um, common property resources that um, small farmers across the world, particularly in Africa, have access to as unproductive, unused or idle. And so if you redefine the land in that kind of way, then it becomes possible to say, well, it's important to invest in it, to improve it, to expand uh, production of monocultures, to feed the world. But in fact, this, the story is what ha what's happening is that um, small farmers who are feeding themselves already and feeding their local communities are being resettled and f forced off the land um, and moving into the ranks of the hunger, hungry or into the uh, slums in the cities um, and the food is going largely back to the global market to people like us who have the money to buy the food um, and that you know the right to purchase food um, is, is part of that deal. So um, the land deal explosion in 2012 for example um, involved 200 million acres um, uh, the size of arable land in Western Europe so it gives you some sense of the significance of this process. Now this process is taking place within a particular threshold that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Rome summit um, that took place in 2008, um, the, the elites of the world, um, the, the World Bank etc decided that um, the best thing to do was to encourage investment in agriculture, in particular in Africa, um, to bring small farmers into value chains, contract farming, to produce 
commodities to be sold on the global market. And the whole idea was that uh, the response to the food crisis was, let's do more of the same, but this time we'll focus on small farmers as the producers and we'll bring them into value chains, provide them with fertilizer and seeds and chemicals, and they can grow food um, to feed the world. Um, a more recent version of this is the new alliance of, for um, uh, food security and nutrition, which the group of eight, the, the rich countries, um, have set up largely in Africa. I mean, it is in, it's targeting Africa, um, but it's displacing an initial response by the G8 countries after the food crisis to pour public investment into domestic agriculture. So immediately after the food crisis around 2008, 2009, um, the development agencies were actually thinking fairly creatively and realizing they needed to put public investment back into agriculture because of the long-standing agrarian crisis. Um, but that didn't take long to, to disappear. And now, of course, it's been uh, modified and qualified and it's now um, public-private partnerships where public investment from Europe, say, is coming into Africa to support, to complement private investment by large agribusinesses and they're grabbing the best land, um, they're creating corridors um, of land that um, can produce on a large scale, produce commodities for the world market and of course a lot of people are being resettled or just kicked off the land and, and it's quite a fascinating process. Um, but it's all about um, how to respond to the crisis, business as usual. Meanwhile, there was a report that came out in 2008 that um, was making a very opposite conclusion, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science Technology for Development. Um, and they argued, and this was put together over four years with 400 experts from the academic world, from the uh, farming world, from the development agency world, from NGOs, etc. And they argued small-scale sustainable agriculture, locally adapted seed and ecological farming better address the complexities of climate change, hunger, poverty, and productive demands on agriculture. Um, so what I'm trying to get across is that there's a, there's a threshold that we're, we're at, um, and there's a huge struggle going on between these two different forms of agriculture. And it's quite fascinating to, to see how it's taking place and who's taking which side, et cetera. Um, so it's, it, working in Rome is, is kind of interesting. Um, this is a cartoon that captures how the market operates. Don't think I need to explain that. Um, this captures the idea of flex crops, whether it's um, feed crops, whether it's food crops, whether it's palm oil, or whether it's um, bioeconomic crops. Um, you know, when you when you drink out of a, one of these things, they they advertise these now. These are all plant-based um, plastics. I mean, they're not plastics, not chemical. It's plastic. It's plant-based. Um, so it's um, it's natural natural bottle. Um, so these are the four possibilities that um, investors have to, um, so it depends on where's the best return. So if Larry, for example, is an investor, maybe you are Larry, I don't know, but um, <laughs> yeah, we're both crooks. <laughs> so, um, so we're looking for the best return. And so, you know, if it's, if it's not food, it's something else. And um, so what it means is that, um, those meat eaters or those people who have SUVs are well served um, sometimes and those people who just need basic staples um, can't get access to food, food crops. So this is just to, to give you a sense of the um, extent of meatification which is a term that um, Tony Weiss, a geographer at University of Western Ontario uses. Um, and I think, I think it's important to point out the um, impact of livestocking on greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Um, industrial agriculture has been estimated to um, produce a third of greenhouse gas emissions by, by various estimates. That's very interesting when Al Gore, um, was it uh, 2000 when his book came out, um, you guys were, most of you guys were too young, but Al Gore came out with a book on um, inconvenient truths about climate change. No mention of agriculture. Pub, the pub, public would have been totally unaware of how impactful industrial agriculture is on 
um, ecosystems and on um, greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, water use is quite extraordinary too. Um, another way of looking at this is um, uh, this report Greenpeace put out about um, rainforests being knocked down to pr produce soy to um, sell to Europe um, for the fast food industry, for, the, for you know, feeding chickens, um, etc. And um, as, a, as a consequence of Greenpeace's activity, um, there was actually a moratorium put on rainforest soy. Um, and um, some of the big um, fast food outlets like McDonald's joined that. The only outlet that, di that didn't join was um, Burger King for whatever reason, I don't know, but um, it was a very successful boycott that the European citizens organized and um, it just shows that um, one can draw attention to the consequences of these commodity chains um, with some ac action. Um, this is just an aerial photograph of the um, clearance of mang mangroves for aquaculture in Mozambique. Um, this is just a graphic of uh, the urbanization of the countryside when you cover it with oil palm monoculture, you knock down forests and that's been huge in Southeast Asia um, because it's, first of all, um, it's a subsidized industry and, and, and secondly, it's a growing industry because as you know, um, oh. oh, I had a cartoon, I'm not sure, it's not here anymore. As you know, when we, when we fill up at the gas tank, 10% is ethanol. Um, so with the full fuel versus food, in, in Southeast Asia in particular, palm oil, which is the principal cooking oil, um, was, was now being um, sent off to, to Europe um, as biodiesel. Um, and there are a couple of paradoxes. Firstly, that um, cooking oil for the poorest, the cost doubled. I mean, sorry, the, the cooking oil d doubled as a fuel for energy-intensive northern co consumers. So, so poor, cons poor consumers in Southeast Asia could not uh, purchase cooking oil now because it was becoming too expensive, uh, because it was more profitable to uh, send it off to Europe as a biodiesel. And secondly, um, this kind of urbanization of the countryside has um, environmental impacts, of course. Um, so this, these are, you know, all of these issues have to do with um, tracing out the externalities of our lifestyle, essentially, and realizing that our lifestyle has huge social and, and e economic and e environmental um, implications. This is just a quick uh, point pointing to the fact that um, because of the, um, the subsidy of corn for biodiesel by the uh, Bush government, actually back in um, uh, the early 2000s, encouraged farmers more and more to grow um, corn for bio, biodiesel and um, of course this inflated corn prices but also affected the price of other grains and pushed them up and the World Bank ended up estimating that biofuels caused 75% of the world's food inflation in 2007 and I think that that's actually a, an exaggeration. Um, I've seen better estimates, something around 45% but nevertheless um, it is an interesting issue that it just shows that um, um, food can be so susceptible to, to other demands. Oh, here's, the, here's the cartoon. It sort of captures um, some of the issues involved. So, for Hunger Games, um, Guatemala is one example here. I was speaking to a woman from Guatemala this morning and um, we were commenting on this that um, um, there's a palm oil rush in Guatemala, which is affecting the, the availability of local food. Um, and um, it's just a, it's, it's a classic case of a, a country that's a southern country that has been turned into a, a food exporter and now a fuel exporter. Um, I just received yesterday some new projections um, about um, biofuels. Um, 12% of maize and of course grains will go to biofuel production by 2023, 14% vegetable oils, 28% of sugar. Um, so this is all um, part of the, the story of the conversion of agricultural land for the biofuels industry. Um, the drivers of these new enclosures, um, uh, I don't need to you know, explain that, um, I've talked about that already. Um, carbon offsets, I think, is an important part of the story, and here's a picture um, of the, the Indigenous Environmental Network put out this um, picture of um, companies that are involved in 
gaining access to land um, to, to produce uh, <coughs> plantations um, in, in return for carbon credits um, and people being evicted from their lands. So that's another part of this whole process, the, the whole carbon, the carbon market, um, as, uh, which, is, which is letting countries in, say, Europe off the hook, uh, letting companies th that are polluting off the hook by um, buying carbon credits and um, uh, using those carbon credits to um, um, access forests, etc., elsewhere. So now, because of this process, the, the, the original claim that the massive movement of food around the world, one could develop it by arguing the massive movement of money around the world is forcing the increased movement of people. So the land enclosure issue is a very serious issue now. Um, and um, it's not clear where it's going to go. Some of these land deals are not uh, working out because the people like Larry, who are investors in land, um, don't know that much about farming, and so they don't quite know what to do with the land once they get it. Um, so there's a lot of land just sitting idle, but the problem is that um, some of the people who own that land are simply speculating on it because they know in the future it'll be used in one way or another, um, and meanwhile it's not being used to produce food. Um, so this ISTAD report I mentioned earlier um, captures, I think, this growing international scientific consensus that's beginning to emerge and create these new debates that agribusiness as usual is no longer an option. We need to focus on agricultural multifunctionality. In other words, see farming as ecological farming, as providing jobs, as um, having an, an, an aesthetic quality about it, etc. Um, that agroecology is as productive as industrial agriculture and it has a restorative um, dimension to it. It restores the land, restores water cycles, maintains biodiversity and so forth. Um, and of course, this links to the food sovereignty movements. That's where I'm finishing up now. Um, so the food sovereignty movement emerged in the 1990s within the terms, within the middle of this agrarian crisis I mentioned earlier, where farmers were losing supports, and they were also finding that they were being pushed off the land by low price uh, food that was being dumped in their markets. Um, they defined, redefined food security from a trade-based to a rights-based concept and practice. Very important difference there. Um, they argued nations should have the right to consume rather than trade the food they produce. They also argued that farming and indigenous peoples should have land rights to secure farming practices, local food provisioning, and ecological stewardship. So it's a very different paradigm, and it's that paradigm that has informed the ISAD report, for example, but it's also informing the debates that I'm involved in now in Rome in the Committee on World Food Security. So it's quite fascinating to see how that's playing out. Um, there were demonstrations, of course, against the WTO ministerials in Hong Kong and Cancun. Um, one can argue that the food sovereignty movement is, an, is a true anti-systemic movement. The La Via Campesina is the largest social movement in the world with over 200 um, people in it um, across, across various countries. Um, its program of substantive rights, I, I'll just read this out, should introduce, governments should introduce policies to restore the economic condition of small farmers by providing fair allocation of uh, product productive resources to farmers, recognizing their rights as producers of society and recognizing community rights in managing local resources. What I really like about that is the idea of producers of society because I think that in the future, given ecological degradation, given climate change, um, given food security issues and food justice issues, um, we're going to see more and more of this, I think, this idea that um, farming is not simply about um, a way of life for a farm household. It's about performing an important social and public function within a society. And unfortunately, that's been devalued over the last 30 or 40 years. But I think it's coming back, and it's a very interesting development. So food security, food sovereignty style, um, within the FAO deliberations, there's been a promising trend to protect small farmers. The Committee on World Food Security opened up to the civil society organizations, which I work with now, um, their voice is now included, and the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty has secured the, the right to food principle and is, and is, um, initially and is now really pushing for the right to produce food, which is basically saying we need to protect value and restore um, the small producer model of farming um, as, as an essential foundation of human survival. 
Hewitt, the rapporteur um, in human rights, argued that the provisions of the WTO's agricultural agreement treat food security as a deviation from the primary objective of agricultural trade liber liberalization. So Olivier de Schutte is, has, has mounted a direct attack on the WTO through the unit, from the United Nations. It's interesting, the two organizations are at, at loggerheads somewhat. And he argues the question for whose benefit is at least as important as the question how to produce more. So what he's arguing there is that the, the, the normal agribusiness style reflex is productivism. In other words, to feed the world, we just have to produce more. We need GM crops, we need this and that, smart agriculture. Um, we need to grab land, we need to expand large-scale agriculture. Um, and he's, re he's re responding by saying, well, in doing that, you're pushing people off the land who know how to grow food in their particular environments. And um, we're going to lose all that farmer knowledge. We need to restore that kind of farming, protect it, build it up, um, use public monies, etc. cetera. Um, so um, this is the last so slide. Uh, I think we're seeing a new game emerging. The FAO in 2011 said there's a new paradigm for ecosystem-based territorial food system planning based on a more localized approach to food. And remember, a more localized approach to food is also about addressing poverty and hunger, um, just to connect back to the wealth poverty um, theme. It holds the potential to create new forms of connectivity across urban rural landscapes, bring concept of sustainability in um, as an integrative policy tool that links human and environmental health. So these are the kinds of issues that are emerging and they give me a lot of hope. Um, it's still pushing something uphill, but um, nevertheless, I think it's a very interesting development and um, here's some pictures to finish off. Thank you very much. There's one couple over there. Yeah. Uh, is this on? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. All right, first of all, great speech. Um, one question I have, though, in particular, is about uh, the, the biofuel thing. Like, uh, on one hand, a lot of the problems about the global hunger situation is that climate change can really kind of uh, amplify a lot of the problems that it poses. And biofuels are bad because uh, like a lot of the stuff used for the biofuels can be better used to feed the hungry. However, biofuels are also seen as a way to help combat climate change. So weighing the pros and the cons, is biofuels something we can reasonably approach or is it something that we should probably dump off in favor of something that could help combat climate change without further escalating the food situation? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I, I've been asked that question before. And um, there are a couple of things to point out there. One is that the International Energy Association has, has predicted that by 2030, only 9% of our energy needs could ever be covered by biofuels. Um, just wait until I get your attention. Um, did you hear what I just said? Can you repeat it back to me? No, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you, you know, biofuels are not just about palm oil. Um, biofuels have been part of traditional agriculture for centuries. In other words, dung, animal dung. So if we, would, if we were to move all the animals out of the factory farms and put them back on mixed farms, which is where they should be, um, because they're part of the whole ecological cycle on mixed farms, um, that's one source of, um, of um, biofuel for, for locals to use. Not, it's not for cars, it's for, for people. Um, so I'm just saying that because it's always important to remember that biofuels are not just industrial forms. The other point, of course, is that um, um, we need to change our um, consumption of energy and, and our emission um, footprints. 
And um, you know all the answers to that, you know, how we can do that, whether we can do it is another question. But one thing that I find um, important about um, promoting small-scale diverse farming is that um, it's, um, the, the, the La Via Campesina ar argues that it cools the planet because it's low input agriculture, um, it doesn't emit on the scale that um, industrial agriculture does, so it be, would be one way of reducing possibly um, a quarter of the, the emissions that we presently put up into the atmosphere. And um, so that's one, one way of thinking about it. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a trade-off there that um, if, if you go small and diverse, biodiverse, um, you can actually reduce emissions that way anyway. Um, so why, why use biofuels? I mean, what biofuels do essentially is to continue the business as usual approach, but um, it doesn't mean that um, we're going to deal with the problem um, of emissions as well as food security. So that's where I'd begin to answer your question. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question about uh, TTIP and the, the TTIP or TTP, it has a bunch of different names, but it's basically the, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right. And um, I, I guess I, from what I know, um, it is very detrimental, to, especially to the global south. And so I'm wondering how do, um, what do you know about TTIP and how it relates to food security? especially like wealth and poverty in the global south? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I'm afraid I don't know a lot. I don't work on that in particular. The couple of things I do know is that um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership... Um, I thought you were leaving the room. <laughs> the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, is actually a deal that's to be worked out between uh, the United States and Australia and various countries in East and Southeast Asia um, but it's leaving out the poorest countries. So one argument is that it's really not a development um, agreement. It's, it's simply about um, opening up a, a, um, you know, a regional multilateral trade sphere um, for the benefit of um, large corporations who are actually the ones who are, who are writing the protocols. Um, the other big concern I've heard about is that uh, people... People, well, two other things. One is um, the pharmaceutical companies are getting involved and they want to stop people having access to generic drugs. Um, and the second thing is that, um, the T which I find the most objectionable, the TPP um, is set up to um, essentially, I'm trying to think of the right word, I'm, I'm going to use a, a quick word, outlaw local food procurement systems. Um, in other words, to remove the protections of local communities that might be developing their own food systems and to argue that those communities should be exposed to the large agribusiness um, suppliers. So to me, that's a, a very direct attack on this alternative food movement that I think is mushrooming across the world. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering, uh, throughout uh, the seminar, um, you kept using the terms industrial farm and small farm, mm -hmm. and I have an idea of, you know, being a farmer here in Appalachia, what mm -hmm. those terms mean in the United States, but for you, when you use the term small farm, um, what description are you using, what description should we have in mind of those farms? Thanks. Um, I think I'd probably start with the seed that... Um, most farming communities around the world, not necessarily in the United States, but most farming communities around the world um, produce and exchange and save their own seeds. And those seeds, as you know much better than I do, um, are um, locally produced and have, have to do with local ecology and climatic conditions and what, whatever. Um, but also the knowledge about those seeds is invested in the community and the web of um, the community relationships. And so... Uh, when I'm talking about um, supporting that kind of agriculture, what I'm trying to get at is that it seems to me that's um, something that needs to be protected. And um, it's not that I'm arguing that um, small-scale farming or peasant farming is the solution to all of the world's problems. What I'm trying to argue are two things. One is that um, uh, 
it seems to me that the smallholders who live on the land, including American farmers, um, should be supported to stay on the land if they want to stay on the land because they're the backbone of our societies um, because food is the most basic thing that we need, as you know. And then secondly, so that's a, that's a sort of a, t a short term, an immediate issue because so many of small farmers, um, uh, and you know the figures better than I, it's about a thousand a week or something are leaving the land in the United States. Um, but across the world in Latin America and Africa, people are being just, you know, evicted en masse. Um, and they're not just people, they're not just farmers, they're people who have knowledge and people who have cultural traditions where they've worked together and they've shared expertise, etc. Um, so we're losing all that knowledge. And for me, um, in the longer term now, um, that knowledge is worth preserving to um, help us address climate change and eco ecosystem degradation, to restore ecosystems. Um, and um, that... Um, it's quite possible that agriculture that depends on fossil fuels, which I regard as industrial agriculture, um, including the transport of those foodstuffs across the world, um, and depends on phosphate, as you probably know much better than I do too, um, that that model of agriculture um, has a limited future. Another way of putting it is it may be unsustainable. So in order to um, anticipate that problem, as I like to say, when the shit hits the fan, I think, oh, I'm being live streamed, I didn't realise. Um, I think that um, uh, we need to anticipate that and it seems to me now is a good time when there's this land rush going on and we really need to recognise that the farmers on the land are actually saying, no, we want to stay and, and we, we regard farming as a way of life and we'd like to maintain that kind of culture, we'd like to produce food for our local citizens, etc. Um, I don't know if that answers all of your question, but that's, that's how I'm looking at it. Thanks, Thanks for the question. Any other queries, puzzles, questions, critiques? I'm open. No? Do you have a question? All right, we're going to have a short test now, so could you all pull out your... <laughs> Come on. Last chance. Last chance. I'll buy you a beer if you ask a question. <laughs> Two beers. <laughs> okay, well, I've probably overwhelmed you with stuff information. But um, thank you for listening and uh, thank you for having me. <laughs>